All right, hi there folks and welcome to another update on Iceland. It's been several weeks since we've talked about Iceland, so I thought we'd circle back and review the latest data and news and some other information that's come out there. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey. Today is Thursday, October 10th. It's about 10 a.m. here Mountain Time, about 4 p.m over in Iceland and let's get right to it. Thanks for joining me and thank you for your support. So like I said, it's been about two weeks since we've talked about Iceland. Uh, during that interval, all the signs have pointed towards magma continuing to accumulate in the shallow subsurface, recharging that magma storage zone and ultimately building towards some sort of event which is to come in the next month or two probably you know late november or maybe early december but we're not sure um, looking at the webcam here i thought this was kind of fun they've actually got a little bit of snow so you can see a uh, good here from this webcam and then a little skiff of snow here in the foreground uh, as well if we look at the camera uh, out by Vogar looking to the south at Kelir and some of the highlands there, you can see some of that snow sitting up there. So that's kind of fun. Uh, there's not a Met Office update that's uh, occurred since September 24th. So I was kind of waiting and hoping that there would be one that I could time in conjunction with this update. Um, but I don't know when they'll put one out next. They may be waiting for more significant data to arise. So I thought I'd still put together this update nonetheless. And I think what I mainly have for you today is not so, you know, very little data um, that might really impress you, I suppose, but some great news stories that Amanda Joe found for me. So I appreciate her help as I put together these updates. If we go through, though, the major um, geologic trends that we would expect to see in conjunction with the magma accumulation, ma mainly the seismicity and the ground deformation. Uh, if we look at this area on the Reykjanes over the last day, you can see, you know, typical pattern, very small earthquakes, somewhat uh, scattered. The usual cluster over here near Krishuvik, uh, some offshore as well. Um, but nothing really happening around the area where we've seen the eruptions occurring in the past. So nothing uh, at all on the seismicity that jumps out. If we look at the past week, uh, there was some good sized earthquakes over here near Badabunga. Um, so this volcano, this central volcano that sits underneath the Vatnat Yokut glacier here. Um, and so these, you know, I think the biggest one here was a three yeah, no, it was a five. I think that, I don't know if that's actually accurate. I thought it was a little bit lower than that. But anyway, they've had some seismicity in this region, but no other evidence or signs of magma moving or any sort of volcanic disturbance whatsoever. So uh, could be tectonic, could be somewhat related to magma movement in the shallow crust. Uh, too early to say. But those were a few days ago. Looking on the Reykjanes, again, just not a whole lot going on here of of note. Um, here's Grindavik down here, the road going north, the area where we saw the last eruptions over the past year, just very quiet size for the seismicity. And the idea here is, is, that, is that magma rises, there's space for it to go. So we had this eruption on August 22nd that um, largely depleted um, or emptied out a good portion of that magma storage system. And now we are accumulating magma back into that storage system, but we're not breaking rock. We're not seeing a pressurized system. And that's why we're not seeing a lot of seismicity in this region. The other little patterns of earthquakes we see here are more likely related to um, faults associated with the plate boundary and tectonic stress. Um, we would expect to see ground deformation and maybe some other signs if these were related to magma movement and uh, any sort of potential volcanic event that might be uh, coming up sometime in the future. So again, quiet from uh, an earthquake standpoint, when we look at the ground deformation, we can start with the GPS first. This is uh, one of the stations we've been looking at, Svartsengi. This is near the power plant. Uh, again, if you're new to these, they, these um, GPS data comes with three graphs, one that shows the north-south movement of the station over time. So if, it, if the deflection or the dot is trending upwards, that's moving to the north. If it moves down on the graph, that would be a southward motion. Uh, the middle graph shows east-west motion. So up is east, down is west. And then the final graph is vertical motion, up being, um, you know, if it moves up on the graph, it's up vertically, increase in elevation. And if it's a downward movement, that would be a downward drop 
in the elevation. So you can see the big change in the pattern here right at that eruption point August 22nd. So these this station here had been moving to the north and to the east um, and then there was a pronounced movement um, to the south and to the west and also downward as the magma actually came to the surface started erupting that dropped the elevation down but since that time uh, after maybe a week or two we've been seeing pretty steady accumulation of the magma here you can see that the the slope of this line is a little less steep than this line here and so it could be that we have magma coming in at a slower rate than we had previously or it could be that there's a little bit more space in the system there's a larger volume for the magma to fill and so we're seeing less upward movement of this gps station as a result of the magma accumulation so uh, or maybe some combination therein so there's some of the gps data um, and the other stations are very much showing the same pattern is what we see with the Spart Singhi station there. Um, but you can check these out if you want. These, are, these will all be under the video description if you want to take a look at some of this data yourself. There are some new uh, INSAR interferograms, some more INSAR data to look at. The satellites continue to periodically pass overhead. And so when it passes over the region where we've seen the eruptions, it takes a measurement with radar of exactly what the elevation of the land is and when it comes back over a week or two later it does a similar sort of thing and then it can actually measure the dis difference there so if we scroll down and find one for uh, the Reykjanes you can see this one that really just pops out so first pass of the satellite here with the Terrasar satellite was September 23rd and then another pass on October 4th so during that interval we have this kind of change in the um, in the data here and I'm trying to find my little uh, cheat sheet here for this is the Terrasar yeah so each color band here is I think one and a half centimeters of uh, change in elevation so you can kind of count the the numbers there and see what that would relate to in terms of the the time for that period of time so we're looking at several centimeters of uplift during that time based on the INSAR pattern here uh, maybe we can scroll down then it goes to some of the other here's a different um, uh, satellite the Cosmos Sky Med um, so you can see that pattern again shows up that bullseye pattern shows up nicely right around the power plant Blue Lagoon area um, and that one was for September 26 to October 3rd and yeah here's another one here from the sentinel satellite september 19th to october 1st and if you look down there you can see again the little bullseye pattern there so and i'll make sure this is all linked there as well but there's all sorts of these interferograms you can check out that shows the ground deformation so we have very good uh, information that the ground is moving up that inflation is occurring and that is the clear sign that magma is recharging this system and you know when will this all kind of reach ahead um you know folks like bruce could extrapolate the data out but it looks like maybe again mid-november i'd say mid-november to christmas is a pretty good window for the next event whether that's an intrusion or whether we get an actual eruption of course the other big question of course would be where do we see the eruption occurring we know we've had uh, again, as review, we had our December eruption in this area of last year, December 18th. Our January eruption was maybe the most um, scary in a way because it was closest to uh, Grindavik in the town here. Our February eruption, which was back up in this area here, shown um, in red. And then we had the March eruption, which was in many ways similar to the December and February eruptions. The May eruption, which was in the same region again. So you can see there's quite a bit of overlap with those four eruptive events in terms of their location. And then this most recent one, the August one, which was further north. And so the two kind of outliers here in all this mess are the January 14th eruption, which was much closer to uh, Grindavik and down here at the south end of the the dike or this lineament and then the august 22nd eruption which was much further to the north and so these two end members are potentially 
Um, but depending on how you, you slice it, they, they all have their own hazards. This one, the big hazard was uh, potentially sending lava flows down to the roadway. This one obviously was a danger to the town, uh, but all these ones in the middle here were a viable threat to the power plant and the Blue Lagoon. And so all these locations come with their own sort of hazards and uh, problems. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, what happens with this next event. Will it follow suit with the last one and be further to the north? Will it maybe even uh, extend this lineament further to the northeast? Um, only time will tell and we'll have to look at some of the data as we get closer to that. So um, let's look at some of the news now. Uh, Amanda Joe actually sent me some interesting articles here and I want to just give these each a little bit of a quick review and then if you want to you can check these out in the video description and read them on your own. So this one's kind of a, a pretty simple news story. Um, this one talks to Benedict Ofligson who is the uh, works for the Met Office, looks at ground deformation, and basically talks about that, you know, it's, it's the longer period between these eruptions, eruptive events, um, and that the magma volume seemed to be increasing. And so he's saying, again, you know, probably it, with, I think we can be calm until the middle of November, so that, um, you know, it's probably going to take about that long before something too substantial to occur. So kind of a short article there. Uh, and then we have an article about the roadway. So remember that during the, uh, let's get rid of a few of these here, during the August eruption, which is shown here in green, uh, there was some concern, and thankfully it didn't come to fruition, that the flows from this eruptive event and the primary event ended up being at the north end of this fissure system, that these lava flows could eventually make it down to Highway or Road 41 here, Reykjanesbrot, which is the um, road that goes from the Keflavik Airport area and back into the capital region. This is the busiest roadway in all of Iceland. And some of these flows came within a few kilometers of the roadway. And so this is an article um, about you know, looking at different bypasses. So the road administration examining the construction of a bypass. Um, and basically, they just don't have a lot of options. There's no obvious detour that will handle the traffic that passes through Reykjanesbrot every day if, the, if it's closed. So there is the option of rerouting things further south. You can actually uh, drive down Road 42 through the Krishivik area, then along the coastal road, uh, through Grindavik, if, if they were to open that up, the roadway is fine. It's just they're limiting traffic to Grindavik uh, for the time being. And then you could swing around all the way up this way to Keflavik. So there are roads that get you there, albeit they are much more lengthy detours. Uh, but this is just an article that looks at, um, you know, d there are different options there. And just they just don't have a whole lot of options with alternate roadways uh, if this ro this primary roadway here was compromised. Uh, the next article is that if there is another eruption, there could be a considerable amount of uh, gas pollution from that eruption uh, in this town of Vogar. And we did see some of that with this last eruption. If you have the winds coming out of the south or southeast, you can have a lot of this volcanic gas blowing right into some of these communities. And it's not just Vogar, it could be over here. Uh, if it was more of a, a south, you know, east, southeast, it could be over here near towards Keflavik or even into the capital region. And so this article here just talks about the different scenarios. You know, it could be this where it erupts further south by Hagefeld. You know, we talked about those different eruptions there. Um, but the wind direction and the location of the eruption will play a big role in determining exactly, you know, how how much gas is really brought into some of these these urban areas into these towns. Um, this is an interesting one here. So there was a new article in Science that just came out, and I haven't been able to access it yet. I'm trying to get access to the article so I can read the whole thing. Um, but an article in Science that looks at the this last year or so of eruptions there in Iceland and coming looking at the geochemistry mainly and then trying to come up with um, some models for the architecture of the magma storage system that lies underground. And so basically, you know, in a nutshell, what I've been able to glean from this is that the 
data is pretty complicated that they've sampled took lots of samples of lava and they were able to tell that the chemical composition varies quite a bit so they have a fun little cross section in here that shows uh, here is Fagradalsfjall. So this was the area that erupted in 2021 to 2023 and a pathway up from these deeper storage zones here near the mantle. They go up to that. But here's the area that's been erupting over the past year. And what they're envisioning based on the geochemistry is a much more complicated system where there's several sills or lenses, if you want to call them that, of magma. So it's magma is being stored not in one big blob magma body, but in several different discrete um, magma zones, these kind of thin lenses, but they are connected at times. And so you can get complicated things where new magma comes into the system, mixes with maybe an existing batch of magma, then that whole thing erupts. And so you end up with a, a, a hybrid uh, composition of those two magma sources. Um, and so that's kind of, I haven't read the whole article because I haven't had access to it, but that's kind of the idea is that they are looking at different ways that the magma bodies are interacting. And this was kind of validating to me to see, because this is what I had envisioned as well. And some of the sketches I'd put together in older updates, I had trended more towards this more complicated kind of lattice, you know, tiered system of multiple magma zones that can also be um, connected in some ways. And so kind of interesting there um, is to see the way the magma storage system is, is kind of organized in their mind based on the geochemistry. So I'm excited to be able to read that soon, uh, hoping to get access to that as well. But you can read this nice little summary of it here that I'll put under the video description. Uh, and then the last one I have for you here, this is kind of interesting, uh, make that a little bit smaller is apparently the folks in Iceland and public officials have been looking for um, a potential alternate airport location. So the major airport is over here at Keflavik. Why is it here? Well, this is where the US Air Force Base was. And so a lot of the infrastructure that was left here by the US military was in place. And so they sort of modified that and made that their primary airport. And then of course, you know, folks have to like uh, take the road back over here. But apparently, according to this article, there has been other ideas about moving, either moving the airport or having a secondary airport. I'm not sure which. So, And the place that the public officials have looked at moving it to, uh, the place that they're eyeing is this area right here, about halfway between the airport and Reykjavik area at an area called uh, Kvasakron. Um, and so this is what they're kind of looking at here. And e even without even reading the article, I think you folks can see uh, potentially what the problem is. I mean, just look at the Google Earth image, right? So an airport anywhere in this region, perhaps to our geologic eyes, doesn't look like a good idea because we can see there's these flows here, right? There's these flows. I don't know how old these are, probably only a few hundreds of years old, maybe a few thousand at the most. Um, but it looks like flows from uh, the Krishuvik system down here. Whoops, sorry. Uh, from the Krishuvik system in this area have actually moved down and lava has made it all the way to the ocean in this area down here. Um, my computer's kind of froze up now for a second, but so that's kind of alarming and interesting. And so um, this article, which talks to Professor Thordarsson, uh, talks about how he thinks that's not a good idea, that we, we do have um, evidence of this area being volcanically active in the past. Um, the risk is not being changed in any other way. The probability that lava will overflow the airport in that area increases. Um, and so he thinks we should be looking in other areas instead of, um, in another article, he talks about putting our eggs in, in one basket, right? Like maybe we're going to have more eruptions on the Reykjanes Peninsula, and we need to look for other areas uh, if we're going to build another airport instead of looking sort of in the same the same regions, if you will. So it uh, looks like my Google Earth is kind of frozen up there. So, But I think you get the, get the, the gist of it there. Is it working now? Nope. Okay. Uh, anyway, so that is the, the news I have for you for right now. We'll keep monitoring this as we do. And thanks again to Amanda Joe for getting some of these great articles to me. And we'll just see how things come. Uh, I will definitely do another update if and when there is another Met Office update. And so I think that will be helpful. Certainly if any of the 
primary data changes or sh shows a significant shift, I'll get back with you as soon as I can. But for now, thanks for your time. Thanks for your support of the channel. Hope this was helpful. And we'll just keep waiting and watching uh, this part of Iceland. And thanks so much. Take care.